Hello Horror Hounds. In June 1816, almost exactly 200 years ago, a gathering happened which was to prove to be the most important gathering in the history of all horror fiction. Many of you will know exactly what I'm talking about just from the title of this video. But uh, on the shores of Lake Geneva, in the Villa Diodati, met Lord Byron, the Romantic poet, and his peer, Percy Shelley, his partner, Mary Godwin, the future Mary Shelley, uh, Claire Claremont, uh, and Dr. Polyadori, Byron's biographer. Uh, and they would spend uh, a, a time there uh, and there were a famous few days where they were rained in and thunderstorms so, that, so they couldn't go out. And they entertained themselves with ghost stories and came up with a competition amongst themselves to create their own ghost stories. Out of this gathering and meeting of minds came, less famously, Polyodori's novella The Vampire, which uh, it's widely accepted, drew inspiration from Byron as the character of Lord Ruthven, so giving us the introduction of the Byronic vampire, the aristocratic vampire, the first uh, story to successfully marry vampire folklore with a literary narrative tradition and giving us the precedent for the Byronic vampire that set the stall for Bram Stoker's Dracula, created the template for the stat in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. If anyone thinks that Gary Oldman's version of Dracula in the Francis Ford Coppola movie is not a Byronic figure, then you're talking out of your hat. But <laughs> it would have been a meeting of note just for that novella, The Vampire. The fact that Mary Shelley had the seeds of inspiration for Frankenstein at that gathering. The first book of science fiction, some would say, the absolute cornerstone of the kind of Western horror tradition that we know today. And many of you will have seen this meeting uh, represented on film. Uh, specifically, probably, uh, most of you will have seen it as uh, the little coda at the start of Bride of Frankenstein. But if you've never seen Ken Russell's Gothic, you will never see a version uh, of that period and that meeting like this and you will never again. Ken Russell, baby. There's nothing like it. We watched it last night. I think I'd seen it once before. I, I love it. It's not without its flaws, but my God, this is a, a work of unbridled joy. It's, it's been called batshit crazy and let's call a spade a spade. This film's batshit crazy. The cast is a, is a pretty strong who's who of uh, British thesps. The first name I'm going to mention, though, I don't think she's British, I think she's Canadian. Miriam Sire, I hope I pronounced that surname right, C-Y-R. She's got possibly one of the most thankless roles uh, of Claire Claremont, essentially uh, a groupie of Byron's. Uh, she, she travels a thousand miles to, to, to meet him in, in exile. Uh, and to sort of surprise, I'm here, sort of like the, the crazy ex turning up on your doorstep. She does most of the writhing around and the nudity and, uh, and the chewing of rats. You can, okay, with, with just those few sentences, I've given you a hint of some of the nuttiness that, <laughs> that unfolds in this film. But she does that with such gusto and such aplomb. She really brings the life out of a fairly slim part. Uh, beyond that, we've got uh, Timothy Spall as Polidori, who, 
most of you will, uh, most people will probably recognise from the Harry Potter movies. I know my girlfriend said, is he, is he in the Harry Potter? Is he in one of the Harry Potters? Yes, he's also in a shit ton of uh, other stuff. He's the sort of outsider of the group and he gets, he gets to play really broad. I mean, there's no real nuance required in a Ken Russell movie. So when I say that Timothy Spall gets to go broad in a Ken Russell movie, you know we're talking about uh, as broad as the side of the Titanic. <laughs> uh, Julian Sands has taken a lot of stick for his performance as Percy Shelley in this. And yeah, it's, I, I'm on the fair, he's, he's not the strongest actor in the world, Julian Sands. I'm not his greatest fan. I think he's fairly weak. But, but bizarrely, his weaknesses as an actor in this weirdly play to the strengths of his characterization as Percy Shelley in this, as uh, especially over the course of the, the night that this film takes place, uh, a, a neurotic, completely out of his head on drugs, on the verge of a nervous breakdown, very fragile, uh, fey sort of soul. It kind of, it kind of works. Gabriel Byrne is having a blast playing uh, Lord Byron as a demonic figure, or almost as a proto-vampire. And uh, Natasha Richardson, uh, in all but name the heroine of the movie, playing Mary Godwin, to be Mary Shelley, the creator of Frankenstein. Um, the fact that she's no longer with us adds a, a weird sort of level of pathos and, and, and fragility to her performance, which has to be, it, 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 she's sort of the straight man of the group, the straight person, if you like. She's the, she's the fixed point around which the madness sort of revolves. So, and she sort of becomes the damsel in distress at the end, sort of, who has to save herself, because no one else is gonna, is gonna save her. So, uh, it's, she gives a really affecting performance, the most nuanced of all of them. She's given the space, the script gives her the space, and the director gives her the space to inject um, some real humanity into this story of essentially a, a group of creative people living at the very extremes and beyond of what was socially acceptable at the time, locked up in a house, getting shit-faced on laudanum and poetry and going absolutely out of their minds. And it's just, it's just the blank check Ken Russell needs to revel in all the things that he loves bringing to his movies, whether they're the big budget ones or the smaller budget ones like this one is, and the small budget tells, but the exuberance with which he fills this film with shocking, surreal, uh, diametrically sort of opposed images clashing together at some... <sighs> it doesn't go in much for blasphemy in this one, but paganism is a, is, is a through line in a lot of his movies, uh, the sort of uh, non-belief in God. There's, a lot, there's, there's paganism in this, and Ken Russell is as Ken Russell does. Uh, and so if you've got a story about Byron and Shelley and the, the time when Frankenstein was created, mixing sex, mixing drugs, uh, mixing ghost stories, uh, paranoia, hallucinations. This is, the, this is the kind of heady cocktail that Ken Russell loves to give us. Uh, and do you know what, whilst it's not scary, it's not a scary horror movie, it's not even a chilling horror movie, this is a this is a cocktail. This is a, uh, that I will gladly drink over and over and over again. It's it's kind of an it's a let me choose the words let me choose my words properly. It's almost it's almost literary horror. There's no scares in it, but you will you will get more out of this the more you know about the personalities involved. Let me. Let me say that. It's not a film without its flaws, but I, an understanding of the marrying of the, the historical reality with uh, the obsessions, uh, the personal obsessions of the director make this 
uh, but it's a one of a kind. Let me give you an idea. Let me read you the, the list of things I, I wrote that Ken will fling at your face. Uh, there's incest, uh, leeches, the thing in the shed, there's weird uh, automatons, sort of uh, clockwork people, uh, self-inflicted stigmata, there's, there's his religious iconography. Uh, there's there's the famous shot of body horror that I don't want to spoil for you. Uh, uh, the replication of uh, the famous painting, uh, The Nightmare. There are dead babies. There are visions of Shelley's death. There's a what I call a vampire abortion that it just le it's It's not explicit, but what... It is, is intensely shocking uh, and the film there quite blithely and in completely on purpose will not tell you what stuff you see is real and what's hallucination and it's not even a case of you'll have to make your mind up at the end. It just doesn't matter. The purpose of this film is to uh, talk in images uh, uh, and visually. It's the language of cinema. This is not a historically accurate portrayal of what happened uh, on the shores of Lake Geneva, but through the language of cinema and image and metaphor and simile, it's trying to give you the feeling of what it might have been like to be in the presence of these people. So bizarrely, I'm going to get a little highfalutin here, forgive me, but in this way Ken Russell's uh, str visual strengths and his steering more towards the pure language of cinema rather than the narrative storytelling have more in common with poetry uh, and the subjects of this film are the two most famous romantic poets in the world than it does with prose storytelling or narrative storytelling. Uh, all of that bundled up, I think, gives a very interesting end product, if not something that everyone would necessarily out and out love. If you've got a love for uh, the novel of Frankenstein, if you've got a love for this period and uh, the, lit the gothic literary tradition that comes before it, that is mentioned in this, that this film has more gothic tropes in it than it has anything to do with uh, romanticism. There's uh, this sc uh, skulls and shadows and uh, running up and down steps and through corridors in a storm and, and lightning uh, around uh, this building and being chased and... Uh, the, the damsel in the in the flowing nightgown. This is much more Castle of Otranto than it is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but it acknowledges that the one comes from the other. Nothing is created in a, in a vacuum, and it's a it's a blast. It's an absolute blast. There's shocking stuff in this. There's some. Some of it, some of the shocking stuff, is some shocking acting. Let's not mince words. But this, it, it's like you're caught up in a, in a, in a party. It's, it's weirdly 60s psychedelia infused, but that's fine. That just makes uh, this early 19th century uh, story feel more modern. If you want an idea of some touchstones of films you may have seen, if you haven't seen this one, to try and recommend it to you. Uh, where did, what did I write? Um, if you're a fan of Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicle, no Chronicle novels, watch this film. That's, that's, that's all there is to it. Um, there's uh, here and there, there are, there are uh, senses for me of, of Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Here and there, there's a feeling of parts of uh, the original Evil Dead. Uh, there are hints of uh, 
giallo, uh, Italian giallo horror in this, uh, and much more specifically, uh, Suspiria, sprinkled throughout. So if any of those that you've seen and you loved uh, make you think, well, I, I like all of those, then give Gothic a go. It won't scare you, but it will, sh it will have a whirlwind of a time. It will wrap you up in it and spit you out at the end. And uh, it will show you things you won't see anywhere else. And what more can you ask for?